My name's Reed. Uh, I'm the general manager of Airbnb here in New York City. And it's a very vaguely defined role. I was the first GM we ever hired. Uh, I came to the company in 2013. Um, we've hired over a thousand employees since I started. Um, and not, not just here in New York, we're, we're up to about 30 people now, but just globally. Um, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about Airbnb itself for those that aren't totally familiar. Uh, and then I'll get into a few of the challenges just I've seen personally that we've faced as we've gone from being a relatively small company to being a company that's now in 34,000 cities and now 191 countries. If you guys have questions, go ahead and interrupt me. This is probably going to be like a 10 minute presentation and then we can just chat. Isn't this cool, the way that it does like the little video thing? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so Airbnb is a, it's the world's largest community driven hospitality company. Uh, people can book apartments, castles, villas. The villa is really nice. Uh, it's a global community, um, and that's one of the things that's been driving its growth. It's part of the uh, sharing economy, connecting people to travel places and one another around the world. Um, I don't know how much you've touched on the sharing economy as a theme of this, this conference, but to us it means, first of all, a global network of other companies similar to ours, but insane growth and insane growth opportunities. The, at the core of the sharing economy is the idea that people are simply using an underutilized asset uh, to provide a service that's actually better or more affordable than what was, out, what was out there to begin with. What it means is that the the growth engine itself is incredible once you start to hit scale. So I'm going to walk you guys through basically how the company got, actually I'm going to skip this, sorry. It started back in 2007. Three guys didn't have enough money to pay their rent in San Francisco. Uh, two of them were designers. This will come in later when we start talking about our culture and how we try to maintain it as we've grown like crazy. So the two guys on the outside, Brian and Joe, were graduates of the Rhode Island School of Design. And then Nate in the middle was the nerd who did all the technology. Uh, at the time of the founding, when the guys, well, before the founding, the guys ran out of money, Nate was up uh, in Boston finishing his last company. But Brian and Joe were living here. They didn't have enough money, uh, but a design conference was coming to town. They realized that if they put down some air mattresses and they could convince three people to stay in the apartment on the air mattress, they could pay rent. So they built a little website and advertised themselves as an accommodation option for the design conference. They managed to find three, three guests who we still talk to today. We bring them back for company offsites and the like. And they, an idea was born. Now this is an interesting piece. What happened was um, it wasn't enough to do the design conference they ran out of money again once they tried to start a company. You're, you're starting to see a pattern here. Uh, so what they did was they went and bought a whole bunch of cheap cereal from a Costco. And it was during the presidential campaign, so there was a lot of popularity around Obama and McCain. And they designed these boxes, put the cheap cereal in these designed boxes, and then sold these to election enthusiasts all over the country. And they made about $40,000. What's important is that this has nothing to do with our core business. We've never gone back to the cereal business. And it's part of our lore, though, because what happened was they got their first break uh, at what's called Y Combinator, which is one of the top incubators in the United States. Paul Graham's head of Y Combinator um, basically rejected him. He's like, this is the dumbest idea I've heard in a long time. Why the hell would I want somebody sleeping on my couch? And they said, okay, we understand, thank you. And they left behind a box of cereal. Graham's like, what, what the hell is this? And he's like, well, this is what we did when we ran out of money just like a couple weeks ago. So they get in the car and they go, and then Graham calls him about a day later. And he's like, look, I still think it's an incredibly stupid idea, but I gotta admire your cockroach mentality. Like, I can't believe you went to the trouble of like buying and making cereal just to pay rent so you can get back to your dream. So this has actually become part of our culture, the, this core value of serial entrepreneurship. You just do whatever it takes to get it done. All right, here's how it works. Let me stop. Who, who's here is familiar with Airbnb? Oh, geez, good grief. Okay, hang on. I'm not kidding. I, I, I spoke to a group of Korean executives yesterday from like the third largest company in Korea, and it was the same statistic. I need to change these slides. Everyone knows Airbnb now. All right. This is where it gets interesting. In 2009, we started out really just in a handful of cities. You'll notice there in Denver, you've got a pop. That was just because of the Denver Convention in 2008, and it goes away the next year. New York is still pretty big. Europe starts to take off. Europe really starts to take off in 2011. We go to war with a company called Wimdu, uh, which is part of this internet conglomerate based out of Germany, whose model is to copy a business model that's working in the United States and build the exact same thing in other countries. The eBay of Turkey, the Zappos of Brazil. Um, it's contentious, a lot of people in the Bay Area don't like it because it's copying, but it does allow for pretty nice exit opportunities because the American company grows 
And then when they're ready to go expand, there's a company that looks exactly like them, operating exactly as they do in the country they want to go to next, and you just turn over the keys. Our guys decided we didn't want to do that, we wanted to go to war, because culture was important. So in 2012, we put, a, I think, 50 or 75 employees on the ground almost overnight in Europe, and that was really the beginning of our hiring binge. We started to grow this company because we realized that we had a need that we hadn't served and that couldn't be served from headquarters. That theme is going to continue as we, as we grow. 2013, Europe is continuing to grow. 2014. Now, I don't have the sexy slide for 2015, but here are the numbers. We are at 35 million guests, 1.2 million listings, 34,000 cities, and 191 countries, all in a matter of a couple of years. We as a company have gone from being literally a guy, an idea a couple guys had in their, in their apartment for a design festival to a company that's in the, in the news a lot. Um, attracting a lot of attention, particularly here in New York, negotiating with some of the largest cities in the world, um, and becoming things like the official hospitality partner of the Olympics and the World Cup. All of this means there's a tremendous burden on your existing headcount. So we've been hiring like crazy. And so a couple things started to happen. I'll, I'll move to like the, the pretty end slide here. Oops. All right, we're done with impact. The first challenge, and this really I saw when I came on board, is that the recruiting process itself is starting to break down. Uh, in 2013, when I was coming out of the company, I had 18 interviews with 23 people. Um, and this was a result of deliberate effort because everyone was really nervous about New York and meeting with the founders and the executive team. But I understood that it was indicative of the, the rest of the process. We had so many people trying to apply for so many roles, and the team was stretched so thin that things were happening like candidates would get an offer, and then the letter wouldn't arrive for like two or three weeks. So the candidate is incredibly nervous and maybe taking another job. That's not a good thing. Uh, people's schedules are so busy, and we didn't have an aligned approach to carving out time for interviews. So not only were interviewers interviewing candidates and asking the exact same questions that the last interviewer had, there was no clarity as to, this is what I want you to focus on in this interview. This is what I want you to focus on. Um, but people were meeting with, di different interviewers were meeting with different candidates, which made it hard to compare when you finally did the roundup. Well, I interviewed these two candidates, but not this third one, so I'll have to defer to you guys. It all started to fall apart. Uh, we were losing good candidates, and we started to realize that that was not the right way to go about it. So we went back to our founder's mentality, design mentality, RISD. They're big fans of Disney. And so we storyboarded the entire recruitment process. Literally every step, every stage of a candidate's life cycle with us, starting when they first hear about the company, actually starting when we first post a job, all the way through either the offer or, sorry, this is not quite for you, but let's stay in touch stage. And as a result, our process got a lot tighter. We managed to organize ourselves better around interviews, candidates, and then we got smaller touches, like when a candidate shows up on site for their interview, somebody's written on, you know, a little welcome note on the whiteboard in their interview room. Candidates who didn't get accepted, their own friends are now applying for jobs to Airbnb. We see this as a really good sign that not only getting it right, the process for the candidates we bring in, we're getting it right for the candidates that we decide not to bring on board, which is really important because the, the second challenge we've got in addition to the process itself, is that the roles themselves are changing faster than the job descriptions. Like literally, I, I mean, I swear, I've got a rule of thumb where every month I leave a job description open, I need an extra year of work experience in the candidate I eventually bring on. And it gives our, our recruiting team complete headaches, but it's true. Like, as we grow, as we learn, we start to get smarter about our needs, but we still realize that the challenges we're going to face six months from now and 12 months from now and 18 months from now are totally different than the ones we faced last month and the quarter before. And we literally dropped a team into Cuba earlier this year. We didn't know how to do that. No American company's been in Cuba for 50 years. If you'd asked us in December, what's going to be your big strategic priority and how you're going to hire against that, no one would have said, well, America's going to make peace with Cuba and then we're going to go in. We had no clue. So that's one of our challenges. And, and one of the ways we solve that is by maintaining very good relationships with people who we don't, we don't accept and by making sure that our own employees frankly feel like Airbnb is the right place to work. I think our, our, our promotion rate, like 90% of our employees would recommend Airbnb is a great place to work. Now that gives us room to, you know, room to grow, room to expand, but when you think about the fact that the hiring team themselves don't necessarily have visibility into what our needs are gonna be, but actually the knowledge of where we are as a company and where we're going as a company is actually distributed throughout the employee base. The fact that all of our employees are out there thinking about their friends, thinking about people they meet at various conferences, conventions, through partnerships with other companies, constantly thinking about, is this person, I see where my team is going, I see where this org is going, I see where the strategy is evolving, I've got a pipeline of a couple of people I'd like to start talking to about Airbnb, 
it starts to make the pipeline itself a lot more robust and more reflective of our needs as they start to evolve and change. Another challenge you've got is as you grow and as you get profile, uh, your pipeline starts to be full of people who are attracted to the prestige, the growth story, the, the rocket ship, which is great because you want people who are ambitious and hungry and want to be part of something exciting. But that's not necessarily the kind of people who are going to be the right culture champions, the right drivers of the core mission, the mission and the culture that have made you successful in the first place. They're attracted to a symptom of those things rather than being really close to the core, close to the culture itself. And so one of the things we've done, and it's been interesting to watch this, is we really codified our core values as a company. Um, we had a, I remember my third week, I think it was, a, it was December, November, December in 2013, Marissa Meyer from Yahoo came and did a fireside chat. And she said, she, we were talking about corporate culture. At the time, we were maybe 500 employees. And she said, when you hit 1,000 employees, your culture is pretty much set. That's the moment in which you actually have a culture at that point. It's either good culture or bad culture, but that's your time. And we all looked around, we looked at our growth rates, we're like, you know, hang on, that's like three months from now, how are we gonna do this? So the, team, the founding team and the executive team got together and started to write down what they thought were the most important values that reflected us as a company. The relationship we wanted to have with our customers, with each other, and we laid them out as these six core values. And not only are they core to how we evaluate our employees internally in performance reviews, they're core to how we communicate with one another, how we recognize one another, but they're also part of the recruiting and interview process. It's a way to make sure that as we grow, and even as we're hiring people who are just damn smart and really talented, and I think they're right for this role, but hopefully they're right for what this is in 12 or 18 months, but we're pretty sure they're a great culture fit. They've got it. And that's really important. When you think about a company that's growing like ours, the number of touch points that interact with a customer that really aren't subject to direct corporate control. I mean, take customer support. Customer support is one of the most important functions of this company. If you think about when those people interact with customers, it's not necessarily at a super happy moment. There's something's going, something's going wrong. I mean, God forbid they've got a lockout or they can't find the listing or the website's not working. Those are unbelievably important moments. We call them moments of truth. That's the chance for you as a company to prove your value, prove your brand. <clears throat> and given the vagaries and given how new the things are that we're creating, you can't possibly plan for every single permutation. But what you can do is make sure that every customer support person you hire, every specialist is a culture carrier of who we are, what we stand for, and what we represent. So that at that moment, when that customer is interacting with that employee, they're getting the best our culture can bring, the best our brand can provide, even as we try to figure out these problems. And that's important when you think about how many people you need to hire to make that work. I mean, as a company, we're getting better at customer support, much better. Uh, we're using algorithms, our processes are getting better, the product is getting better. That's solving a tremendous number of challenges. But still, these cases do happen. They're incredibly rare. And when the company itself, when the interactions, the products, the customers are growing exponentially, and customer support is growing largely linearly, that's a huge challenge. You're basically hiring like crazy, and you've got to hire all over the world because we're in, again, 34,000 cities. That's a lot of language and cultures. It's a lot of time zones to cover. You've got to hire all over the world. You've got to do so in a way that's consistent with the brand and the culture. And you've got to make sure that all those experiences are going to be as good as the customer could want them to be. Any questions so far? No? Really? Go ahead. So you spoke about defining your cultural fit and then mm -hmm. implementing Well, I wouldn't, it's not necessarily boxes being checked and, you know, scoring. It's really candidates are evaluated as part of the regular evaluation process on the extent to which they would be a good fit for the culture and really, as we say, a good champion in the mission. Do you collect data and what are you finding if you can share anything around variables that are um, impactful in terms of um, the hiring process. So how many touch points do you have? Is it phone interviews, then you're meeting internal team, and then, you know, specific roles that you have people talk to? How many are within that department versus higher ups? Like what, yep. again, variables, data points are you seeing? I can't speak to specifics as to how one, one country's procedure, one region's procedure would vary over others. There's obviously different employment laws and rules and things we need to deal with. Um, I know across the board, we're trying to get more efficient around both uh, what we consider like time to offer between like first contact, first outreach, and when they actually get an offer. Um, and I know this because my own talent partners are constantly on me to like, all right, make a decision, get them on the calendar, let's get the offer letter out, or let's pass. So that's, we're trying to shrink that as much as possible, just because that's, an, that's a core driver of a positive candidate experience on both sides. 
if the candidate wants to accept the offer, it feels like you had a lot of momentum and you just blew through this and it's great. And if they didn't, you feel like they feel like they were treated respectfully. Their time was 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 taken care of. We know that people are taking time away from high impact jobs to, to talk to us, to work with us. And so we want to make sure that's that, that investment of their time is done as efficiently as possible. Um, I do think we're trying to simplify the number of interviewees that are required to make a judgment on a candidate. And I, I think we've gotten a lot ahead of that, but I think we've got even more challenges moving down the road. I think when you're talking about within a function, um, we have some of the best engineers in the world. You put them in a room with an engineering candidate, they can, pre can this guy code? They know whether they can or not. Uh, but when you start talking about more complicated positions, uh, cross-functional roles, where there's maybe a little bit of communications and marketing, maybe some product involved, some design, it starts to get a lot more complicated around decision rights. It's like, even as we evolve as an organization, our priorities change, who should have the, who, who is the hiring manager? Who should have the decision as to whether this is the right candidate? Who should be focused on which aspects of evaluating this candidate? Um, those, those are challenges we're still working through. Um, and I think it's an indication of how much we as a company are obsessed with solving these issues that are really cross-functional and complex. People can help solve them, but processes help too. Somebody wants to hire somebody from another country and mm -hmm. they want it done yesterday. And as a VP of HR, I'm like, <laughs> it's great, but that's going to take eight time. weeks, you know. And uh, A member of my team is applying for starting the green card process. So I'm thinking, what is, all right, I have to describe what this role would look like two years from now. I'm like, I don't know what this role looks like in two months. So I'm working on that. Um, we also try to hire locally wherever we can. If you think about the, there's a few exceptions. Uh, customer support, we tried to regionalize. But when we put teams on the ground, we literally are hiring people from that country because the level of expertise, the way in which we, we, we deliver value by having boots on the ground can only really come from those boots being someone who grew up in the country, lives in the country, knows the country, can help work with local partners, local, work with local branding agencies, do local media interviews. So it's not so much, I wouldn't say it's a tremendous amount of us hiring people from the United States and then perishing them in all of the world at all. It's actually us going out there, finding people who live in these countries, working for peer or similar companies, and actually helping them understand that Airbnb is a better home for them which creates its own complexities. We now are starting entities in all of, these, all of these markets and countries, but it's less of us just moving people around. I know over the course of the next year or two, we're gonna start looking more at that because another issue we didn't talk about is um, internal employee development. And one of the nice things about working for Airbnb is that we're in so many markets, we're dealing with so many interesting challenges. You as, a, as a, an employee are gonna want exposure to those challenges. So I think we're increasingly gonna see employees who are interested in, well, it's like, I've been doing partnerships in Brazil but I'd really like to try doing you know, um, a different kind of maybe distribution or online marketing in another market. Now we've got to take someone who's a Brazilian citizen and find them a role in Italy or France or Russia or China. So it's going to get more complicated for us to really help our employees take advantage of those resources and those assets. So guys, for some of these questions that are much more complicated, if you can just follow up afterwards, and I'll, we have people who know how to talk about these things, and I'll, I'll, I'll grab them. I'll, I'll make, I'm happy to make an introduction. Good. Could you tell me a little bit about your recruitment team structure? It sounds like it's mm -hmm. all done internally, but mm -hmm. do you have folks that are responsible for sourcing to the after candidate experience? Mm -hmm. One big change is that we've now put everyone under a large team called employee experience. And so that includes our, we, our Mark Levy, who was our I think, global head of HR, is now our global head of employee experience. And under that sits this gal, Jill, Jill Riapel, and she is in charge of talent and recruitment. Um, so we have people who are effectively talent partners for each function. So I, as the, the business guy, have talent partners that specialize in recruiting business candidates and cross-functional management candidates, marketing candidates in this region. Uh, the engineering team has talent partners. The design team have talent partners. And I can't speak to what the original logic was, but I'll tell you what makes it work well is that not only do you build a very good trusting relationship between the partner and the teams who are making the hiring decisions, but the talent partners themselves develop really good instincts as to who's a good candidate. Because they've now seen, I can't tell you, like hundreds of resumes of roughly the same profile. I mean, my talent partner is much better than I am now at vetting whether someone is going to be someone I'm going to want to talk to or not. But if, if you have specific structural questions around how that's organized, whether it's regionally or functionally and how that works in, say, Europe, where we have you know, a dozen different functions, but we also got 20 different countries, I'm happy to follow up and get that information. So how did you get the mindset shift? The recruiting team put so much thought and care into the storyboarding 
it was something we can respect as a, as a design company. We understood that a tremendous amount of thought went into this and when they come up and say, look, being there on time for the interview, asking these questions specifically asked of you and not the same questions the last person asked, being timely and filling out your feedback so that we can get back to this candidate right away, positively or negatively, that, that you know, here's how it all fits within the storyboard, here's why that's a moment of truth, here's how that ties back to our culture about being hosts and treating everyone like a guest, that starts to resonate. Um, messaging from senior leadership, really like you know, Brian and the other two founders, the executive team, treating recruiting as their number one priority and making it very clear that that's how they were, prior, that's how they were focused, that mattered a lot. And then also as a company, feeling, feeling the pain of not necessarily having the right people yet in the right roles and realizing it's because we, didn't, we weren't collectively committed enough to the recruitment process. Now, a lot of this was underway when I joined. I mean, this was kind of an evolution between, say, late 2013 and early 2014. 2014 is when we really, really started to codify this and re revamp our procedures. Um, the, all those things started, started to come together. I now spend a third of my time recruiting, either interviewing, interviewing people who are out there passively recruiting or sitting on interview panels for other folks. And we, I personally, I mean, it's, it's a lot of time, but I also realize how incredibly important it is when I look around the team and I'm like, I'm really glad we invested back in the day in not only finding these candidates, but making sure they got treated right so they actually joined the company and you know, took those jobs. Moving away from just the recruitment piece, what are some of the incentives that you offer employees to make it such a great employee experience long term and retain them? Take our, our headquarters, for example. It's very well known. We have an internal food program. We don't outsource that. It's cuisine from a rotating menu of 190 little cult different cultures and countries. Um, all of our conference rooms and workspaces are based on listings themselves. So they're very interesting places to work. I will say one of the more interesting innovations we came up, came up with, we actually won a Can Lion Design Award for this. Our Portland customer support headquarters. Uh, rather than having people sit at desks or rows or cubicles, we realized our employees really wanted to walk around and take calls. Some people are comfortable taking calls at a counter. Some people like to stand, sit down. So we built a an, more than an open plan. There's just all sorts of different nooks and places to sit and talk and gather around. And then we built the technology system to allow each employee to take their laptop and still have these frankly highly confidential calls with customers to clear those tickets. And we think it not only creates a better working environment for customer support, but because it's a better working environment for customer support, they're more enthusiastic toward the culture. They believe even their, their belief in the mission and the culture is validated every day in the environment in which they operate, which comes through in the way they treat and engage with our customers at those really difficult, challenging moments. Thanks, guys.